Last month, we did a video about third places, or the areas and institutions and neighborhoods where people across class lines can safely socialize and build community. We talked about how they seem to be disappearing everywhere to the detriment of everyone in these neighborhoods, but especially young people. We got a lot of positive responses to that video. Thank you for that. Now, one of the most common responses we got to the video about third places is to support public libraries. I can't tell you how many comments I saw basically saying that. It seems like a lot of people are recognizing that public libraries are one of the few third places left. One comment from Willow Creeper said, please visit your public library. As librarians, we are actively fighting to maintain third spaces with free Wi-Fi, bathrooms, places to sit, books, and information. Most now have non-quiet areas to spend time playing games or talk. We are overworked and underpaid, but we're here because we believe our communities deserve freedom of information and spaces where you don't have to pay to exist. In this video, I want to talk about public libraries, and I want to talk about the situation they're facing. And I won't be the first person to do so. There have been a lot of TikToks about public libraries, a lot of conversations on social media. There's this one popular creator named Michael who posts videos like these. There's this kid looking for books in the Spanish section. Finally finds a book, runs over to our grown-up who's working on their laptop and says, Dad, I found a book. Can you please help me read it? The dad looks at the book and goes, I'm really sorry, buddy. I don't know any Spanish, but if you give me just a couple more minutes, I promise we'll find a book together. Kid runs back over to the Spanish section, and as they do, another kid runs up and goes, I think I know Spanish. Can, we, can I help you read this book? Both kids walk over to our little tiny couch, start reading the book. The other kid's growing up goes up to the dad and goes, I'm really sorry. My kid doesn't know a single word of Spanish. They just really like people. I'm so sorry. Dad starts laughing, the grown-ups engage in conversation, both kids are over there reading slash not really reading the Spanish book. Another kid who's been watching the whole time, appears to be slightly older than the other two kids, goes over to them and says, Hi, I know Spanish. Can we all read the book together? The two kids scoot over, the third kid sits down, and then that kid who knows Spanish starts reading the book to the other two little kids. After a few minutes, they finish the book, they all go their separate ways, the kid who knew, knew Spanish goes up there, grown up, and says, Grandma! Did you see me? The grandma puts their, their arm around the kid and they're both just smiling, big gigantic smiles and they both leave the library. And I love it. I am now confident that library kids are going to save the world. Yes. Michael's a supervising librarian at the Solano County Library in California. That video you just saw has over 20 million views as of this recording. Michael has a lot of videos like these and some of them come back to a central message. This tweet with the video serves as a good example. It has a caption that reads, PSA, come back to your local library. You belong there. What's the context of this? Before we go further, let's have a word from our sponsor, MD Hair. Our sponsors are very important to our program. It'd be hard to do this without them. MD Hair provides clinically proven, customized hair regrowth treatment developed by dermatologists. MD Hair sent me a bunch of really nice products. They sent me this shampoo and this conditioner, which I've really liked. You can see they're quite well worn. They sent me a hair serum. Okay, I really like this too. They sent me these supplements and collagen powder. And it's all with the idea of not only hair growth, but hair health in general like this customized hair care serum, which contains aloe vera extract, black castor oil, avocado oil, a bunch of different extracts and cool stuff. And their products are vegan, sugar-free, sulfate-free, and non-GMO. MD Hair provides a subscription-based service that first evaluates your hair situation by giving you a quiz to evaluate your scalp, seeing what level of hair loss you may be at, as well as what other problems you're experiencing, and then building customized products for you to utilize over time. It's really cool. Hair health is not just a matter of superficiality. It's not just about how you look. It's a really important indicator of and place to treat yourself in terms of your physical health. It's tied to nutrition and it's tied to the repelling of disease and bacteria. Now, I can't measure hair growth so far. It's been a month, but I've really enjoyed the products. My hair feels better than ever. It's really working for me and I, I like it. So I, I want you to try it if you're interested in this sort of thing. Use the link in the promo code in the description to get your first month of products from MD Hair for 70% off. Thank you to MD Hair for sponsoring the video and let's get onward. Let's talk about libraries and stuff. Woo! Well, it seems like library attendance has been declining over the past decade or so in the United States, with about 392 visits per 100 people in 2019 declining from about 527 in 2010. 
That, of course, predates the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the UK, the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy show physical library visits fell from 214.6 million to 59.7 million in the year to March 2021. The thing is, at the same time, public libraries have been expanding their reach and expanding the things that they can do with their spaces. And a lot of people are taking notice of this as well. In a piece for the New York Times, urbanist Carrie Jacobs notes the growth of book borrowing and reading app Libby and speaks to numerous library directors about, as Washington, D.C.'s city library director put it, getting people to come and stay for long periods of time to see the library as their co-working space or their third place. But despite all of the updates and all the positive reception that public libraries have received over many years, governments seem more and more apt to reward them by cutting their funding. Recently, New York City Mayor and supervillain Eric Adams proposed a $10 million budget cut to public libraries, which was thankfully quickly negotiated out in following weeks, but that represents a more positive case in what has been a swarm of cases similar to this across the United States, and many of them are not so fortunate. This is just another example of how politicians and the people that control them are constantly at odds with public spaces and with the things that make public life good. And with the rise of fascism in everything, including media and politics, it seems like the task to undermine these institutions is more and more empowered. And that's why it is super important for Gen Z and Gen Alpha and Gen Beta and Sigma to recognize the utility of public libraries and to fight for them sooner rather than later. Because we need them. Who's that talking in the it's easy to take public libraries for granted as being generally good, always fine institutions that support something as loaded as intellectualism, a place where people can go to read books and get smart. But the library is not only important because of its educative potential. Libraries are crucial locations for health of societies, for humanitarian aid, for the building of organizations, and so on. A 2010 study from Los Angeles found that mothers and children from homeless shelters benefited immensely from public libraries when it came to their mental health, when it came to their expression, and of course their education. One mother talked about the public library as being the place she could take her children to support their literacy development. Public libraries also represent great meeting spaces and really important technology providers for neighborhoods, where people can rent out laptops and sometimes film equipment, sometimes musical instruments for free, regardless of their identity, where they come from, etc. You can see this in the huge amount of programs that public libraries host. The New York Public Library alone hosts over 93,000 per year, including job support events, story time events, Argentine tango events, music production lab events, language learning events, and more. Bet you didn't know all that about public libraries. Bet now you're gonna go to your public library and try to do the tango. Yeah. They're often spaces where employees and volunteers work tirelessly and often thanklessly to provide resources for people around them. In 2019, when Iran suffered from devastating flash floods, its public libraries sprung into action. One of the most noticeable activities performed by the public libraries in the flood-stricken provinces and others was the provision of supportive cultural packages, consisting of books, stationery, toys, and food by a campaign named Spring of Kindness. And the article that I found this from has a whole lot of previous studies cited about different roles that libraries take on, about relief and resources and training that libraries provide for things like mental health and anxiety, particularly in these situations of crisis. In other words, libraries are good. You know that they're good. They're better than you thought they were, and you need to go to your library. <laughs> but of course, while libraries are helping communities through crises, said communities are being coerced into creating crises for the libraries themselves. Fuck the poor. So let's talk about public library and funding. Why is it that this issue persists? If public libraries are so popular and they're so uncontroversial as positive additions to a neighborhood, then why is it that politicians seem hell-bent on reducing funding towards them? Well, usually when we're talking about cutting public spending and we're talking about cutting funds for important public institutions, that happens alongside the cutting of taxes for the wealthy not everybody else usually, with overall aims of sustaining the economy and fighting inflation. And this type of economic policy combo meal is called austerity. 
For years, austerity has been seen as a kind of fact of life economic policy, especially in the US, where we don't even use the term very much. It mostly originates and is used in Europe. It's always brought along with the logic of, oh, we're in so much debt, our countries are in so much debt, we're spending too much money, you gotta cut the amount of spent. That's what you do when you got debt, right? When you're in a precarious situation financially, you gotta cut your spending. So that's what we're gonna do. Of course, we're cutting spending specifically on things that only benefit the working class and that specifically really help them a lot to maintain the economy. But you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, dude. Get to work. It's gonna be fine if you don't have healthcare or housing or anything else. But as far as the tax cuts part for the wealthy, well, obviously the wealthy need to have more money. How else are they going to decide to invest in our neighborhoods with these amazing companies like Starbucks and Amazon that create the best jobs for everyone to properly pull themselves up by their bootstraps with? Look, this economic policy has been dunked on time and time again. It's pretty obvious that it doesn't work. It's obvious that across different countries like the UK and the US and of course Greece, these austerity measures have not benefited the economy in any way. And of course, these tend to be very unpopular too, maybe not in the US because I don't know, we have problems. But generally, we see national debts continue to grow while unemployment rises and while businesses still continue to move their assets all over the world with no real care for these generous cuts that they're offered. This is the analysis that political scientists and economists like Mark Blythe have offered for many years in response to global austerity-fueled crises. This common sense of austerity, of reducing public debt all at once through slashing services, involves a question of equity who pays and who doesn't. Those who made this mess won't, while those who already paid for it through the bailouts will pay again through austerity. This is why austerity is not common sense. It's a nonsense and a dangerous one at that. Now, while Blythe's analysis are great for understanding austerity generally and why it doesn't work and what effects it's had even historically, it may have an issue in terms of the analysis of why it happens in the first place. In particular, it may not quite be nonsense in the way that Mark Blythe describes. This is discussed in Clara Matei's important new book. It's kind of new. It's from November. The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. In the book, Matei contends that austerity is not in fact a poorly thought out response to economic precarity, but actually a policy that does exactly what it's supposed to. In his famous book, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, the political scientist Mark Blythe shows that although austerity has not worked in the sense of achieving its stated goals across history, e.g. reducing debt or boosting economic growth, it has nonetheless been employed by governments over and over again. Blythe refers to this pattern of compulsive repetition as a form of madness. However, if we view austerity in this book's terms as a response not just to economic crises, e.g. contraction of output and heightened inflation, but to crises of capitalism, we can begin to see the method in the madness. Austerity is a vital bulwark in defense of the capitalist system. What Matei's getting at and analyzes really thoughtfully in this book is that Austerity proposes that it's supposed to solve economic issues, but really it is implemented to discipline working class people. Namely, that their conditions are made so bad that they are forced to continuously sell their labor to capitalists for as cheap as possible in order to make a living, to survive, and to ensure they don't have the time or the optimism to work with other workers to unionize, to strike, to fight for their rights. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. I mean, there is a, there's been a systematic change where employees feel the employer is extremely lucky to have them, um, as opposed to the other way around. So it's a dynamic that has to change. We've got to kill that attitude, and that has to come through hurting the economy, which is what the whole global, you know, the, the world is trying to do. The governments around the world are trying to increase unemployment to get that to some sort of normality. She says austerity must be understood for what it is and remains, an anti-democratic reaction to threats of bottom-up social change. It's not a coincidence that a lot of the public sector, the programs and the institutions are founded by people who are not capitalists who wants to ensure better social conditions for their communities, namely how the New Deal emerged from the agitations of communists in the US. The case of public libraries is a little bit different. 
Though Benjamin Franklin is attributed as the person who created the first public library in America in Philadelphia, this library was based on a subscription service. A lot of the public libraries around that time and up until the 20th century were not free. The first true free to use by all library in the US emerged in New Hampshire in 1833, where at a town hall meeting, citizens decided to fund a free library through taxation. And that's not surprising because New England was settled by the Puritans in the 1600s who, among other things, really valued literacy. They really found it important that their children learn how to read and interpret the Bible for themselves, which helped them establish societies with extraordinary literacy rates. But it is the 20th century wherein through two world wars, the American Library Association coordinated efforts to provide books and support armed forces when public libraries became the significant institutions of American life that we know today. Now, the ALA has its own fraught history, being cozy with elites, being very cozy with segregation in many instances, but its foothold in the US, key to the countries maintaining tons of public libraries, many of which are well regarded, is a testament to a Puritan ideal of literacy as fundamental to society. And of course, the efforts of millions of working class people to provide services to others. This is maybe why the public library seems like our last bastion of community. It's been insulated enough by its connection to establishment and its connection to establishment ideals that it's very hard to take down in the same way programs like affirmative action are. And yet, still, many public libraries are fighting against budget cuts. Now, you may have heard about book bans going on in the US. As it turns out, a lot of people are very interested in banning books from libraries that seem woke or that are, you know, written by LGBTQ plus people that may or may not have some type of diversity or interest in a better society. And it's not a coincidence that this stuff is happening while libraries are also being threatened with budget cuts at the same time, as in places like Missouri. In fact, like Matei's book title suggests, austerity has everything to do with this far right love of identity politic wars and the fall of Western civilization, which is to say, austerity loves fascism. How do you get people who have been sold on these Puritan ideals of the importance of literacy and the importance of libraries to then turn against these same libraries? Well, maybe you play into that other thing that Puritans were really into, witch hunts. Wokeness is a term that everyone and their mother has debated about in the American public sphere over the past couple of years, referring pejoratively to ideas of anti-racism, feminism, and others which criticize hegemonies and advocate for a more just world. This is a version of the same culture war debates that have been happening in the US since God knows when. Public figures and well-funded media organizations work in tandem now with online far-right communities to promote conspiracy theories and prop up critical ideology as fundamentally threatening to our civilization and way of life. This is not just friendly to fascism, it is fascism. Fascist movements have always fashioned themselves on the idea of a national identity that involves banning and genociding people who do not fit into that national identity and who can be scapegoated as threatening it. I hope I don't have to explain to you why fascism is bad. I, you, you know. Instead, I want to talk about Matei's analysis of how fascism is often very cozy with liberal democracy in order to maintain this capital order. For one, you know who was really into austerity? Benito Mussolini. In the early 20th century, Italian socialists built increasingly powerful movements in response to economic crisis after World War I, aimed at worker ownership of industry and an end to capitalist exploitation. Two red years of conflict in which socialists began gaining huge power democratically ended in black shirt fascist militias violently suppressing the movements and staging a coup d'etat of the Italian government, positioning itself as the force of law and order. That's Mussolini's National Fascist Party. One of Mussolini's first prominent acts as leader of the National Fascist Party was to implement austerity, architected by economists like Maffeo Pantaleoni, who quipped that where socialism is strong, where democracy is strong, public finance will go the wrong way. Can't have that. This austerity was following in the footsteps of the austerity that was happening in Britain a couple years prior. Beginning in spring 1920, harsh monetary deflation took a toll on British employment. Fiscal and industrial austerity quickly followed, with unprecedented cuts, regressive taxation, privatization, and repressive measures to control workers' direct action. 
These policies were obviously unpopular, and British technocrats, or the economists that gained footholds in positions of power advising these governments to take these steps, basically came up with this whole line of people being lazy and needing to work harder. Inflation was the main threat to the market economy, and the causes of inflation fundamentally rested in exaggerated spending on the part of the general population, especially its lower ranks. Interesting how we're seeing in 2023 rich people saying the same things, you know? Anyway, fast forward a couple years, moved to Italy, and Mussolini's saying this in his first speech as head of parliament. The directives of domestic policies are summed up in these words, thrift, work, discipline. The financial problem is crucial. The budget has to be balanced as soon as possible. Austerity regime, spending intelligently, the support to the productive forces of the nation, ending all war controls and state interferences. Fascism makes it really easy to stomp people out, which is very necessary when people are threatening the power that you hold. Rather than get into the intellectual discussion of why you are essentially stealing money from people and giving it to yourself over and over again, you can implement these seemingly unavoidable, completely dominating cuts to public spending and to people's way of life, and then also blame them for why they did it until eventually they believe it themselves. If we can agree that certain people who are criticizing exploitation in the economy, criticizing racial divides, criticizing problems with society, are actually trying to destroy the world, then it's totally fine to just ban their books and censor them and kick them out of places. Because, you know, they're evil. Now, here's the thing. Britain was quite happy with what Mussolini was doing. Even though Britain was ostensibly a liberal democracy, they were, let's say, critically supportive of Mussolini's austerity. British technocrats understood that the groundwork for insulating capitalism in Italy would take the form of austerity, and implementing that austerity would require a strong government. The British found those conditions in the form of Mussolini's dictatorship. Fascism imitated the principles of austerity. We see similar collaboration happening today. We see politicians who swear by freedom and democracy in the same breath ban people from different backgrounds for basically no reason other than being from different backgrounds and wanting to have equal rights. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds will simultaneously praise the troops for protecting our freedoms and then take those freedoms away from Iowans by passing a law in May banning books with descriptions or depictions of sex acts, prohibit instruction on gender identity or sexual orientation before 7th grade, require schools to notify parents if a student requests to use new pronouns, and enshrine the constitutionally protected right for parents to make decisions for their children. That last part is ominously ambiguous. I don't know about you, but I am certainly not very confident in the ability for most people's parents to properly conduct themselves in the face of their children reading things they don't like for whatever reason. But now you have this fulcrum through which these parents can essentially be destructive towards public libraries as soon as their kid walks near a book that they think is weird because the gays smelled it. I don't know why I said it like that. This is a two-pronged attack coming from the same place, capital. It uses ideology to convince us that our communities are corrupting us to justify taking away all of the money and resources in those communities, leaving us scrambling for scraps from big business. In this way, the fight to save public libraries is, in fact, part of the fight to save the world. So I want to let you in on a little secret. I interviewed Michael, the person from earlier with the reels and TikToks, and I asked him about his journey in becoming a librarian, why he loves the library so much, and what it is we can do to help libraries and help librarians. Yes, my name is Michael Threets. I am the supervising librarian for the Salon County Library, specifically for the Fairfield Civic Center Library. The Salon County Library serves Fairfield, Vallejo, Vacaville, Cordelia, Rio Vista, Dixon, and I think that's all the cities that we serve. I've been with, with the Solano County Library for the last, for almost 10 years, 10 years in November. I'll be, I'll have been a librarian. 
library worker with Sloan County Library. Since being a little baby, uh, my mom would take me to the library. I got the first library card at the age of five simply because my mom was checking out so many books for us. So I've all, the library's always been with me, specifically the library where I'm sitting in right now, uh, where I currently work for is a library that I grew up in. But it was never something that I envisioned as a career. I never thought that I would grow up to become a librarian. It just wasn't on my radar. I think just because of not seeing, not seeing men in libraries on the desk and then also not seeing people of color very often on the desk. But then fast forward several years down the line, trying to start a career. Some things in my life happened that um, that failed, that led me to various mental health struggles. So I returned to the library, I went to the Fairfield Cordelia Library, just sitting there for weeks reading books. And to this day, I don't remember why I did it, but I think just thinking of careers, just being in the library, I was like, oh, this would be a cool, cool place to work. I asked the person at the front desk, I just said, how do you work for the library? She had already pulled up the, the way to do it on the screen. And she was like, I knew you were going to ask that. After a few months, I heard back, got the job. Um, that launched my library career. A lot of things with the library changed during the pandemic. So people don't even know like how different the library is now. I mean, we've always increased our virtual uh, virtual reach with like ebooks, with other databases, homework help online, Libby by Overdrive, Hoopla Digital. Um, I always talk about the musical instruments. We have different databases that help you with your music lessons. And then many people are just unaware that libraries, I mean, we're always going to be about books and library cards, but we have so much more. We have the musical instruments. We have the board games, the video games the movies, we're pursuing bakeware collections, um, gardening, tooling, libraries. My library system has a makerspace. We're with like a 3D printer, sound equipment, other very cool things. But every, every library is not so lucky. Some libraries do only have books and some movies, but even those libraries still offer those things for free. Um, you can come into the library and you can be by yourself. I've been I've been talking about the unhoused a little bit lately, and I like to tell people that they belong just, just as much. Unfortunately, the world is not always the best at offering services to the unhoused. And library library workers are not unhoused professionals. We're not mental health professionals, but we do love to help people. We cherish our community. We want to give them resources. We're encouraging them to come inside just to sit. They can read books. You don't even have to check out the books to read them. And you don't even have to get a library card. You don't have to pay $5 to enter the library. You don't have to say, I promise I'll check something out. You can just walk through. You can just um, embrace it. If you're, if you're feeling unsafe, you can come into the library and feel safe. We're just enhancing that. We're just trying to make it make it better, but we're still focusing on that no cost aspect. That it's just something that you could enjoy just as you are. It's it's accessible to people. So I think the biggest the biggest shock to me doing all of the social media stuff that I've been doing for the last um, six six or so months is how many young people, how many kids are watching the reels and the content that I make. And when I sought out to do that, I know I don't think there was an audience I had in mind other than just trying to just show people the joy of the library. But I'm always shocked when like people will message me on TikTok and Instagram. And it's like, oh my, me and my children love watching you. It just I think that shows shows a lot of like where the, the where the youth, where the kids are going is that they do love the public library. I think that's why that's why being a children's librarian was one of my favorite jobs, just because children are just the sure that they just show sheer joy for the public library. Like just they just are attract they're attracted to books. They just want books. Every, everything about the library just calls out to them. They think it's cool. They have so many so many questions. Sometimes they don't know what a question is, so they have so many statements <laughs> about the public library. And that was just always so great to see. I mean, half, most of the most of the library stories are share are I share are essentially stories from the library kids. It's very difficult for adults to make time. I mean, we work eight hours a day. And that's, and that's, I think that's also important to point out that I don't think the adults who are tired, who are having a hard time, dislike the library. It's just, they have to be reminded why they should prioritize it, why they, why they themselves should come to the library. What are some ways to support the public library other than, of course, attending? Are there things that you can do while you're at the public library that can help the library out? Are there things you can do outside of the public library or even at home that can be very helpful? Yeah, for, I mean, first and foremost is, is, is visiting the library if you can is important. I mean, there is like a lot of libraries have a gate count. So you come in through the door does impact the way that we tell the city officials, county officials, that people are coming to the library. So just you being inside a library even once a year is important. But if not, if you can't come like yearly, monthly, weekly, just come in once and getting a library card, having that library card really helps, helps libraries. Just knowing that more and more people have a library card is huge. The percentage is not great about it, the amount of people that are in the county who have a library card. So the more people who have a library card, even if you don't use it, 
is important. And then we get on to the point of using the library. So even if you can't, but that, and I think that's the view that people don't realize is you can become, I mean, you can become an invisible library user. Like you get your library card one time, you don't have to keep on coming back. If you use our e-resources, if you check out our ebooks, our audiobooks, if you use tutor.com for homework help, if you use Freegal, Freegal is free music um, app. That helps us out. Uh, libraries are paying for these databases. So the more you, the more that people are using them, the more we can justify continuing to pay for them. But I keep on encouraging people to let the library workers know what you want from your public library because community impact is a huge deal to libraries. It's, it's how we make our case to enhance and make libraries even greater than they already are. But also, I think if you just write write letters to your library staff, just thanking them for what they do. I think that's huge. People don't realize how stressed and often burnt out library workers are just because over the top, over the course of our conversation, we kind of touched on some things where library workers wear a lot of hats. There are many, many things that we were not trained on in library, library school. We're not mental health experts. We're not experts in helping out the unhoused, but we get a lot of questions about things that we don't have have the answers to all the time. And again, it can be very stressful because and because library staff are some of the most passionate, empathetic people you'll meet, being so wears down on you. So if people take the time to send out letters, handwritten letters, or find your library website, find the contact us page and just say, hey, I just want to thank all of you. If you know your library worker's name, include their name. Many library people are very introverted. It will slightly embarrass them, but it will also just make their day to know like how much you care about your local library, how much it means to you. Um, and then just let let count let, let your local officials know how important the library is. Just just keep the keep the library at the forefront of their minds so that more and more funding can be diverted towards libraries or just so that county officials can know that hey, people keep on telling me about the library. That's really cool. They must be doing something great. Right. Um, so I think those are a few things to start with that those are super important um, about helping library workers and libraries.